Amen. Amen. Hey, I'm going to welcome uh, the sanctuary who are joining us right now as well. I've got a message for the entire church family. So uh, coming at you from the Great Hall, speaking to the chapel earlier, the sanctuary as well. Um, I was with that crew, our, our chapel sanctuary last week. Uh, just, uh, just have a message for us all today. And so I know it's a little weird uh, watching me on screen. Some of you are at home. Um, you've gotten used to it. You're chilling with your coffee and you're like, no, this is good. But no, it's better in person. Um, but uh, those of you who watch me on, on the big screen, sorry, like I'm bigger than life and that's not, that's not always, not always good. But uh, welcome and good morning to all of our guests. I've, I've met some new folks today. Got a lot of new people showing up in these days and uh, I'm so glad that you're here. I'm curious. I just want to ask this question for everybody uh, here and whoever hears me right here. How many of you were here um, last week? You were here worshiping the Lord with us last week. All right. Okay. Um, how many, some of you are like, I can't remember. I don't know. Um, two weeks ago, how many were here? Raise your hand, like everybody in the sanctuary. Okay, there was like more a couple of weeks ago. Three weeks ago, you were here. You've been here all this time. And some of y'all real quick, because like, I'm here every week, right? Others of us, and there's reasons. I know, I get it. But one of the things we're going to talk about today is um, really consistency in worship. And, and now some of y'all were like, I was here. You bet I was. Look at me. Because I follow Jesus, right? I'm real. I'm for real. But I know, no, that's not really, well, I mean, that's not the case. But it is so important for us to be in the house of God every single week as much as we can. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. But um, before I get into all of that, I want to share a personal word. Um, and you'll see where this message goes and a reason that I'm going to share. I'm going to talk to the whole church family. We're in a pivotal moment here in the history of our church and uh, of our, really of our culture. And so we're going to unpack that a little bit. But before I get there, I just want to share, um, as, as your pastor, people, my people, who I love so much, on a personal note, um, many of you know that my son Travis is getting married. He's got a wedding next weekend, so he's marrying Kate Sutton, and we're so thrilled. We're excited. So we got a big week ahead, uh, family coming in town, even starting today and others. My mom's going to be here next weekend and then with us throughout Thanksgiving and just a great season for us as a church fan. I mean, as a family and a church family, just rejoicing with you, but also on the home front um, where we say Kate makes eight, you know, for the Warren family, <laughs> my daughter, Whitney and Jeff are expecting their first baby. And so we're going to have a grandchild. Yes. And we're so excited about that. Just wanted y'all to know that because she said I could tell everybody today. I said, Whitney, I'm talking to, I want to tell everybody. And so she's going to get the word out there about 14 weeks or so, something like that. And um, they're due in May. So Stacy and I are going to become grandparents. And that's crazy and amazing. I've heard it's amazing from some of you all who've gone before us. You know, it's like, oh, grandbabies are so fun. Now here, thanks. And I'm going to go to sleep, right? And uh, they do the hard work and you get to do the fun stuff. And so um, just wanted to rejoice with you all today before we jump in. So, um, so here, here's where we are today. Uh, you know, we, we are celebrating new life in our family and we've got lots of new kids and babies and a whole new renovated, you know, kid space for lots of good reasons. The Lord said, be fruitful and multiply. You guys are doing that. And so keep obeying the Lord. That's really good. Um, but we're also, you know, on the other side of that, because we do life together, as a church family, We're, we are family. It's one of the major descriptors of the church and um, as brothers and sisters in the Lord, right? Uh, we're also experiencing a lot of grief in these days and a lot of personal grief. I'm gonna speak into that a bit, collective grief, but um, we've had four funerals here this week alone. Um, we're grieving with, um, some of you know, Jamie Carroll, Stephen's wife, I lost her mom this past week, along with the Lozers. We're grieving with them and, and uh, just a lot that we're going through. And I say that because from the start of life to the finish, we are here and we're together. We celebrate together. New life, we grieve together when our loved ones pass and when we go through challenging times. A couple of months ago, um, we remembered a collective moment of grief and loss for our country where, where it really changed everything. Um, when we remember 9-11. On that morning, many of you know where you were, you might remember, um, when you first saw that or heard about it, but Janelle uh, McMillan 
was working in, uh, in the North Tower. And when the first plane hit the North Tower, she and her colleagues decided to get out of the tower and go down the stairs, like a lot of people. And they got to the 13th floor. And the tower collapsed on top of them. She was the lone survivor out of her group of colleagues. And she was the last one to be pulled out of the rubble. 27 hours later, a man she knew as Paul, she finds, you know, like that's all she remembers, says, you are not going to die today. And they pulled her out. She, she talks about how she was just laying there, I mean, dying. Like, I'm, I'm out, I'm done. And she just fought, you know, against all, um, all the, 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 the stuff against her in her life, just um, really, you know, disappearing, going away from her. She was under the ruins, under the rubble, and then she pulled out. I know some of us here today, an apt analogy, I think collectively, some of you might feel like, man, I'm the last person to be coming out of the ruins of what has been this year and a half. Um, I'm the last one to come out of the rubble because I'm still feeling it. And I, what I'm experiencing and seeing in our culture today is this collective grief that we're still walking through. We've done this as a team. About six months ago, I tried to lead us kind of as a church family through it. Let's, let's name it and let's, let's talk about grief and what that looks like, the process, because it is a process. And I am convinced that we are walking through a season of grief. And I just want to, as your pastor, shepherd, lover of you, my people, I just want us all to come around together and to talk about that today. Um, now, some of you might be here today and like, Jeff, I'm done. I'm over it. Like, let's go. You know, everything in my life's up and to the right. And we've got a lot of exciting things and noted in my personal life, family, in the church. I mean, yes, there's all that. This is life, right? It's, it's, it's new life and grief. It's loss and it's the gifting of God. So it's that tension that we live in always. But some of you are like, man, this is, I'm good. Like, don't, don't get me down today, pastor. Like I came here to be encouraged. And that's what I want to do is encourage you. If you are one of those, you can help the rest of us. Okay. So thank you. That's for the church again. Some of you are like, man, I'm just, no, everything is great. But there is a low grade frustration in our culture right now. And it's showing up uh, in a lot of us. I think it's showing up in a lot of personal relationships, probably in your you know, with roommates or friends, maybe you're feeling a bit disconnected and you're wondering what is going on. The new normal that we knew was coming is not all glorious and wonderful is what we're realizing, a lot of us. And I wanna wanna really talk about that, help us process that. Because, you know, we're seeing people, you saw it maybe on the news last night, um, people in in customer service, you know, industries and, and the indicators across the board are people are more frustrated, they're more angry, they're more aggressive, I mean, you see the story about flight attendants and people are just here to serve others. And if we're not careful, that can seep into our lives, you know, as believers. And, and we start to go the way of culture instead of an opportunity for us to say, hey, there's a different way to live. And we're going to show you the way. Christ in us shows the way to live this kind of life. And so what I wanted to do today was just gather the family together and, and just, I, I just want to say this, um, I am tired, I'm tired. And I don't mean that I'm always physically tired, I'm emotionally tired. Um, it's been a season of loss for a lot of us, and it has been for me. Um, anything that, you know, that you've sought to lead during this time has been really difficult. And as, people who lo- and as a pastor who loves his people and loves, you know, there's been so many decisions, I call it decision fatigue, you know, early on, just so hard. And I just wanted to just sit with you, the people I love, and to let you know if you're like me in these days, um, with lots to celebrate. And as I've noted, uh, it's okay to not be okay. And if you're kind of tired, if you feel like I'm still crawling out of this, or I've lost so much, we've lost loved ones literally to COVID and to many things over the past year and a half. We've lost Maybe connections with family, you feel distance, maybe friends who have you thought were in for life and they're gone and you're like, whoa. And you're crawling out of the rubble like me. Um, I wanna say it's okay. Uh, it doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. It means that you're human. And for us to enter into that and just sit in God's presence, wouldn't it be cool if he had a word for us today 
What if you had like a, a real clear word that says, here's what you do when you walk through collective loss and grief? And of course he does. In fact, many passages we could go to, but there's one uh, book in the Bible. You know this, right? It's called Lamentations, which is not a word we use a lot, but it, it literally means uh, an expression of extreme loss, grief, and sorrow. That's what it means. Not the kind of title that just flies off the shelf, right? And so a lot of you, again, are, are you're going, Jeff, why? Come on, man. Like, what a downer today. Wah, wah. Here we are. No, but we, we need to go here. And I, I, will, I will turn the corner because this is what Jeremiah does, right? The place is Jerusalem. And the prophet is Jeremiah. The time is about 586 BC. And what we're seeing here is the destruction of Jerusalem. And so I want you to turn to Lamentations if you're not already there, and you're gonna, we're going to walk through a bit of it today. I'll be jumping around a little bit, so open your Bible. And again, if you're, whether in the sanctuary or, or at home or wherever you're watching this, maybe later sometime, um, grab your Bible. Lamentations chapter 1. It's right after Jeremiah, who is the prophet. And now his lament. This is a series of, of five laments in this, this book is the way it's broken down. And he is seeing a people who are climbing out of the rubble. Uh, hardly. I mean, this is like right in the moment. He's in the middle of it. But how do we walk through uh, a time of grief and loss? Chapter 1, verse 1. Look at what he says. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. How like a widow has she become. She who was great among the nations. She was a princess among the provinces. And she has become a slave. In verse 12, you can keep tracking with me here. Uh, Is it nothing to you, all who pass by? Look and see if there's any sorrow like my sorrow, which is brought upon me. He's saying, anybody? I mean, just look at all of the sorrow. Just here it is. I am, I'm an open book. I am sad. Now, he is talking about, too, a people who have come under the judgment of God is why the city is in ruins. Climbing out of the rubble, Because God has brought judgment upon the people. I'm not saying the pandemic has been a judgment on us. But what I am saying is that God works in all things. And I believe what he's doing in this time among his people. He's refining his church in these days. That's what he's doing. And I want to talk about how I think that's happening in these days. And I'm going to call us to commitment today. And I think I'm preaching to the proverbial choir to those who are, who are all in, some of y'all like four times here in a row, like y'all get extra, I don't know, points in heaven or something. But, uh, but, the, but all of us, I believe many, I'm talking to many of you who are all in and committed to the Lord. Some of you, again, are brand new. Just lean in with me and listen in. I believe the Lord's refining his church these days. Look at verse 16. For these things I weep. My heart flows with tears for a comforter is far from me. He said, I've got no comfort. One to revive my spirit. My children are desolate, for the enemy has prevailed. He said, looks like, looks like God is not winning. And some of us, you know, we we hear all that. It looks like the church, God's people are not winning. In verse 20, it says, I'm in distress. My stomach churns. My heart is wrung within me. Verse uh, 7 of chapter 2. Now look at this. It seems the Lord has, look at this. The Lord has scorned his altar, disowned his sanctuary. Wow. Seems like the enemy's winning. Chapter 2, verse 9. Listen to this. The law is no more, and her prophets find no vision from the Lord. In verse 18, we have no rest. Verse 19, we're crying out in the night. And then go to chapter 3. He says he's a man who is, has seen the affliction under the rod of God, of God's wrath. He's driven him out. He's brought him into darkness without any light. In chapter 3, verse 5, he says, I'm enveloped with bitterness and tribulation. He's walled me in. I cannot escape. I have nowhere to go. You ever felt like this? And again, maybe you're not in in a really, really dark place right now. Maybe you are for, for different reasons. You ever been there? Maybe some of you are today. I've talked to some this week walking through the hardest season of their life for a lot of reasons. And if you're there today, know that this is what I love about the Bible. It's so real and it's so raw. And then he goes on as if to double down. He says, you know, 
in verse 16 of chapter 3. He has made my teeth grind on gravel, made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereft of peace. I've got no peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. You ever been there? I mean, he's in depression. He, he is, he's in a bad place. So I say, my endurance is perished. So is my hope from the Lord. He says, I'm done. I got no more endurance. One of the things Janelle noted while she was laying there under the rubble, she just at times was given up. She said, I'm done. I'm dying. I'm going to die. Maybe you have felt like that. I mean, just emotionally. Uh, maybe you've gone through some mental you know, health uh, challenges like a lot of us here recently, and maybe you are now. He's depressed. He's in trouble. But like the people of Israel, the people of Judah and Jerusalem, Certain moments and seasons mark our lives collectively, right? And that's what this pandemic has been. We come out, we're starting to look out of the rubble, the smoke is clearing, and the new normal doesn't look normal. And for some of us, it's changed very much. Some of you have lost loved ones. Some of you have lost jobs. Some of you have moved from other places and you're new. That's hard. I've met some new people today. And, and by all counts, uh, it looks like a lot of y'all from California, by the way, um, <laughs> And we love Californians. We're glad you're here. Welcome to the promised land, by the way. Let's go. Welcome. We're glad you're here, wherever you came from. Um, but yeah, a lot of us have gone through, even that though has changed, right? You move to a new place and you're maybe new here and you're like, I don't know anybody. We want to reach out to you. We want to connect with you and love you in. But as a pastor, you know, I watch, I, I'm a lover of history, of theology. I'm a student of culture. And so all this, I'm always intrigued by what's going on. Um, and, and what is going on right now is what some have called the great sort. I've talked to some of you about this, um, a great sorting out. There, there's this um, shakedown within the church right now that I've never seen in my, in my ministry. And some of y'all, I just want to name it and, and just bring some clarity here as what we need in a time of confusion. And then we're going to see how Jeremiah leads us forward. But the great sort, it's a term that was uh, used by um, Ed Stetzer. He's, he's a, uh, he's the, he leads the, the Billy Graham uh, Center of Missions and Evangelism at Wheaton College, and he writes a lot. He's got researching teams all around him, and um, he says this. He says, you can break it down like this. About a third of your people, um, and this is for us pastors, but really, you're, you're in this, right? We're all, we're all together. About a third of your people are more in than they've ever been before. Anybody? Like, I am all in. And I'm speaking to a lot of you right now, right here and in our, our chapel and our sanctuary. Right now, you're like, let's go. Let's do this. I'm more committed than I've ever been. And I feel like in many ways, the Lord's refined my heart. And, and I'm going to unpack a lot of this in the days to come throughout the next year. We're going to be talking a lot about how we can live daily to establish really a rule of life where we can enter into the presence of God and be a faithful presence wherever he calls us. We're going to teach us all how to follow Jesus, so much of what he's teaching me these days. And it is freeing and it is wonderful. Um, about a third of us are all in. And I'm calling every one of us to be in the third to call everybody to that point that becomes two-thirds and it becomes all of us. He says about a third of your people have, are like AWOL, like you don't know where they are. A third of your people, like are they, are they coming back? I've seen research that says people aren't coming back. Some people have left the church and aren't coming back to any church. Others have gone to other churches. We have a lot. He says then a third of your people are new. We're seeing a lot of new people in these days. In fact, he writes this right now. And this is what's most interesting to me. That's my phone. Don't need it. Um, what's most interesting to me right now is, is how many of us, as God is refining his church, we need to look hard at now this new normal, the things that we once thought were normal. How much were we relying on those things as a way to move forward? Or were we truly set on Jesus regardless of what's normal, regardless of our circumstances. We've talked a lot about this. Here's what, here's what he writes. People right now, in the U.S. in particular, are sorting themselves into groups where they align ideologically and politically, not so much theologically anymore. Those of us who are leading and shepherding people who've sought to be faithful to Scripture, faithful to a people are seeing, and I'm seeing this, this is what is probably most troubling for me with the American church, 
is that we have, it's been revealed. We've been discipled and formed by political ideologies, secular ideologies, more than the scriptures themselves, more than the way of Jesus. And I, I say that because Stetzer goes on, 30% of people who are coming from, uh, coming into your church new are coming from another church because they left that church because of how they handled the pandemic. Like decisions they made, mask, no mask, this or that. And, and, and he, he goes on to say that there are, he's hearing from, you know, and I've seen this among friends of mine, pastors who've been faithful to preach and teach to people for 20 years, who've loved them well, who've been in community, been in the church, leaving after, after all that because of the way that things were handled or decisions made. And so many have done so not because of scripture, not because of Jesus, not because they're committed to the church, but for other reasons. And I guess I'm saying to some of you who are new, if that's you, go back. Go back to your church. Go back to where you have relationships. Now you, you may, well, I'm sorting through this. We would love to help you sort through that. But I'm telling you that, that we need to stay true to the people that God's called us to. I'm a pastor of the local church. That's what I do. And, and, and if you want to come and join us, yes, come again next week. Come and learn more about who we are. And today you're going to get a real clear picture of who we are. Because I want to talk about that. That's why I'm going to jump into this. So, so what do we do? We do what Jeremiah did. We define reality. Okay? We get real clear about what's happening. And part of being clear is saying we are, we're in a funky place. And a lot of us are hurting and we need to process grief because grief is a process, right? There's, I, I've talked to folks recently, you know, there's, there's shock and denial is what it is. And if you're walking through loss, this is, there's pain and there's, there's guilt. There's anger and bargaining. There, there's, there's depression. There's reflection. There's loneliness. Anybody? And I think that it's a lot of what we've lost. And so... Jeremiah does this. He goes back to what he already knows. And this is what I'm calling you to. Maybe some of you are going to like, this is kind of new for me, but I don't, I don't think for, for too many of us, you're going to be reminded again today. Listen to what he says in chapter three, verse 21. But this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. He says, everything is falling apart around me. He's been three chapters just talking about it. So that's the first thing. We share what our loss is. We've done this recently as a team. Talk about how, what have you lost the most? over the past year and a half. Just say it. Say it to others you love. Process with others. But here's what Jeremiah is going to say. And this is the word of the Lord today. My God has not changed a bit. Regardless of what you've walked through, look at chapter uh, 3, verse 22. In fact, why don't we say this together? Because you know this passage, perhaps. Let's say it together. Let's proclaim this together. Here and in the sanctuary, wherever you are. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him. The soul, my soul who seeks him it is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Amen. Praise be to God. Look at how he shifts. He says, I know what's true. I can see everything, nothing but ruins around me. And I've lost a lot, but God has not changed. And then he says, hey, I'm going to stop listening to my soul I'm going to stop listening to what's in my head and all the stuff that's coming at me. And there's so much coming at us. I'm going to speak to my soul. I'm going to speak truth to my soul. He does what the psalmist does. I'm, listen, my soul. Listen. The Lord is faithful. Remember who he is. And then the rest of the book, he's calling us back. What I'm doing today, a return back to the Lord. He calls us to repentance. And all of us, we need to come before the Lord. How do you need to repent before the Lord? Where have you placed your trust? I've talked to some of you. I talked to some young leaders in our church this week. Man, our business has never been better. Okay, if you want to define yourself by your business, then maybe you're on cloud nine. Maybe you need to repent of that. Your worth is not found 
you know, in the market. It's not found in your circumstances. It's found in Christ and him alone. And the sooner you can learn that, the more you can live at peace throughout the rest of your life. And you're going to be a light in a crazy world. You're going to be a non-anxious presence. Look at what he says in chapter 3, verse 40. Let us test and examine our ways and return to the Lord. Return, repent, and come back to him. And then in verse uh, 58, in chapter 3, you have taken up my cause, O Lord. You've redeemed my life. Listen, if you're in Christ, he has redeemed everything. That's what he does. He redeems and he redeems and he redeems. Even our greatest losses. And I'm just here to remind you today. And I'm going to remain faithful. We are going to remain faithful to focus on Jesus. Jesus Christ is, is the son of God. He is our only hope in the world. And if you've not given your life to him, today is your day. It's why he brought you here today. Why you're listening to me right now. There is no other hope in the world. Christ alone has taken upon himself the mess of our lives. The ruins that have become our lives, our sin, our past, our failures were brought upon him, the perfect one. And he died on the cross. That was ground zero for us. Where his inflexible holiness and his grace, unconditional, never-ending love collided and salvation was made possible for you and for me. And he is the only way to life and the only way to eternal life. That is our message, and that's the message the world needs to hear, friends. Our friends are in the rubble dying spiritually. And we're the ones who have the answer. We can reach down and pull them out. We're the ones who can share the gospel with them. People you already know. The Lord has called us to be this kind of church. And he's calling us to move forward and do whatever it takes to change in this new normal. And yet some of us, even as I know we, we've, we've sung about moving into the promised land, we're bound for the promised land. Some of us, like the people of Israel, they want, we want to go back to Egypt like pre-pandemic. I don't want to go back to Egypt. I don't want to go back to normal. God is not in the normal. He's always moving us forward and he's moving you personally and us collectively to a new place, your family to a new place. He's always doing a new thing. And yet we want to go back and be enslaved in Egypt rather than let's do something new all together because that's where God is. And so when your life is blown up, You've got to say, Lord, I trust you because you're doing a new thing and I'm all in. And so if you want to know, here's where clarity comes, okay? Just to cast some vision now, turn the corner a little bit. If you want to know what we're about, you haven't figured it out yet, and I'm uh, speaking to a couple of new folks I've already met, here's what we're about. We're all about Jesus, okay? Have you picked up on that yet? Because that is going to be the central thing. Who, who do we talk about around here? Who guides every decision we make? Who do we pray for every time we gather? Pray with and, and to. Who, who, who's the head of our church? Jesus Christ is the head of our church. And we exist to the glory of his grace extended to us. He is our Lord. He is our master. Amen. He's the one. So we get back to him. And so our mission because it's all about him. He's already given us. Like, what do we do? What's next? We already know what to do. Pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, all throughout our lives, we exist to make disciples. That's why we're here. Everything we do is to make disciples, reach people who don't know Jesus and to raise them up. We're not just reaching, con we don't making converts. We're making disciples who follow Jesus. And so our commission is the great commission. And you know this, we're a great commission church. You know it. I need to state it again. You want some clarity? Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth have been given to me. This is to you. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Go and make disciples. And here's how this works. Where many of us, again, in a consumer-driven culture, we go, well, I'm going to come to church, and I do this, I go to worship, and then I go to that thing, and then my kids are in this thing, and then spits out disciples, this big machine. That's not how that works. And yet some of us, we kind of approach church that way. Can I say it? Love you. You are a disciple maker. 
Who are you discipling? Who are you seeking to reach for Jesus? Who in your life needs to hear the message? Who's dying regardless of what they look like? And I mean like successful, not successful. Regardless of where they are, they're dying without Jesus Christ. They are in the ruins and life is slipping away from them for all eternity. And we have the answer in Christ. Who are you discipling? Because I, you know, we, I could say it this way. Here's how we say it. We exist to lead all generations to love Jesus. It's that simple. Lead in love, lead in love. Lead all generations to love Jesus like we love him. And a central verse here today, Psalm 145, verse four. One generation commends your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts, your mighty ways. That's what we're doing. And people like me who are really old, I'm going to be a grandfather. Did I tell you all that? I am so whipping old that my life, you know what it is? My life is devoted to the church and to this church and to, to passing the gospel on to the next generation. It's not about me anymore. It's not about my generation. And yeah, we're going to love you and care for you. Like again, all of life from the cradle to the grave. And, and yet we are going to pass the gospel on to the next generation. So we give, we pave the way, we disciple, we mentor, we care for children, we serve. And so many of us, we're way beyond just, you know, learning more about the Bible. We know what to do. Yes, we're constantly growing, but you need to serve others. You need to grow and put into action what you already know is true. We gather and we send out to live in a love like Jesus. That's what we do. You know, the average age of members in our church is 27 years old. And we all need to be investing in this next generation. That's why we have seven ministry residents who are going into ministry. They're serving among us. You've met many of them we, in a residency program that we have established. It's why we, you have been so faithful during the pandemic where many churches just say, well, okay, time out, stop. We can't move forward. We have moved forward with the renovation of our kids' space and we still have a, bit of a ways to go. Stacy and I have prayed through and given our gift of sacrifice to the Lord above and beyond our giving. And I'm asking you to do the same. Every one of us. And to give so that we can be debt-free by the end of this year. Right now, we have 20, no, 2,300 People, 2,300 people who are worshiping with us right now, today on campus or, or online. And we are involved in about 20 different partnerships in the city where we're serving our city. That's the church we are. And I would just break it down this way to describe us, again, if you're new here, and to remind us all, we are a people who are we're united, we are devoted, and we're equipped. That's really what I'm talking about here. We're united. We are one family in Christ. We are united. And, and, and so across generational church and different venues, we are, we're, not, we're not united by age. We're not united by the color of our skin, by gender. We're not united by where we worship or our, you know, how we like to worship or whatever our past might be. We're united in Christ. He's the one who prayed in John 17. You know this. He prayed for unity in the church. He could have prayed for anything. And he prays, God, let, Father, let them be one. Be one because a watching world sees different people gather and loving each other well, and they go, wow, this is like different. And it is a radical kind of love. So radical. We've looked recently, Philippians 2, from the very top, he came all the way down to where we are. The one who, look at this, has all authority, he says, Matthew 28. And he comes and he lays his life down for us, not just dying for us, but on a cross, a criminal's cross, taking on our shame and our sin. And he says, now go live like that. Wait, what? Die to yourself and, and live for others, serve others. And he shows us this stunning picture in John 13. He takes on the, the posture of a slave boy, the most powerful man in the room, takes off his robe, puts a towel around his waist, and he gets down and washes the disciples' feet. And he, don't miss this, he washes Judas' feet. This is enemy love. 
This is so radical that skeptics and people who don't even agree with us or think we're crazy for believing that our whole lives hinge on on a savior who rose from the grave. They think we're nuts. But that kind of love is so stunning. It stops even skeptics, even enemies in their tracks. And that's where God shows up. And that's the kind of love that our culture needs right now. Not the angry shouting back and forth and my, I'm right and you're wrong. What they need is to see people get on their knees and wash feet. That's what they need to see. And that's what I'm calling us to as a church. And I give us high marks to say, way to go, church family, for loving each other well. And friend, if you're not a member of this church, you will be loved into this place and you'll be cared for. But, but I, want to, I just want to say it again. We're united in Jesus, and we're devoted. We're devoted to him. And listen, we are devoted to his word, the Bible. The scriptures teach us how we're to live our lives. This is the authority of God. And we'll be teaching the Bible in every time, every time we gather, in every connect group, and everything we do. Because it points us to the way of Jesus. And listen, we're going to be equipped. We are equipped to live in a new normal in, in a growing secular world. But, but I want to be clear about this, friends. We're not going to let secular ideologies or partisan politics guide what we believe. Many people are being more spiritually formed in those ways than we are in Scripture. And this has been, I think, as a pastor, um, and I'm talking about the broader church. Research bears this out. That's the most disappointing thing for me. Because, listen, we are going to continue to focus on what Jesus is focusing upon. We're going to be winsome persuaders in a culture that needs to hear the truth. And and, and so we're going to care for the poor. We're going to care for immigrants, for refugees. We have opportunities coming up here at Thanksgiving even. We're, We're going to serve them. We're going to be all about the sanctity of life. From the womb to the tomb. We're going to honor those who serve us as we've done recently, those who bring law and order into our communities. We're going to honor them and we're going to support them. We're going to teach biblical sexuality and God's vision for us as male and female for marriage and for the family. And we're going to stand for racial equity and biblical justice in the world. You can place those things in your partisan corners, but the way of Jesus is always a third way. And we will not be trapped in a secular schema that has people running and polarized. That is what Satan's doing in our day. Polarizing even people within the church. We're united in the way of Jesus, so we gotta get back to him He is faithful and true. Amen? He's the one we follow. And so I was reminded, I'll close with this. I was reminded that Jesus went through a season of his ministry like this. He went through many of them. But um, in John John 6 is where this is. Uh, And I've shared this with some of you as well in other groups. But he's he's just fed the 5,000. It's a big crowd gathers around him. 5,000 plus, right? And so after that takes place, they all get fed and it's amazing and there's a miracle and wow. He goes off like he often did um, as if to like, I'm not, I've got to get away from the crowd. I'm not about the crowd. So he does that and he goes off and he um, he's, seeks time alone. The crowd, he goes across the lake. They, they crawl, they, they, they crawl. They go walk around. They, however they get there? They swim, I don't know. They get there and they find him. They get on boats and they find him. So now there's this crowd following him. Big crowd now around him again, along with his disciples. And he knows why they're there. And he says, you guys are like, you know, the people of old who just, you just want to, um, you want to see another miracle. You want manna from heaven. That's what you want. Bread from heaven is what you want. I'm not about the show. That's not why I'm here. This is not a show, is what he says, essentially. And then he says, in fact, I am the bread of life. And then he goes on. He doubles down and he says, in fact, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, 
you cannot follow after me. And they're like, what? Wait, what? And so his PR people come around him, the branding <laughs> team, and they go, this is not going, that's not going well. That's not, don't lead with that message. That's not. And then he, then he turns to them and he's saying, if, you, if I'm not your sustenance, if I am not your life, you don't need to follow me. I'm not about that. And he's all loving. He says, come. He said, everybody come to me. If you're, if you're weary and heavy laden, come to me. But he says, I'm calling you to real life, which is death to yourself, denial of self, to serve others. That's how you serve me. Even after you wash the disciples' feet, right? He says, now you go and serve each other. You wash each other's feet. Because that's where life comes from. Have you figured this out yet? It's a step of faith. And then... He turns to his disciples and he says, are you going to leave now? You guys leaving? Who's in? Who's in? This is my call today. Who is in? Will you commit your life to the Lord again and to his church? Are you in? And then Peter, who normally has his foot in his mouth, says something brilliant. He says, where else will we go? You have the words of life. We got nowhere else to go. And friends, I'm here to tell you that today, this is true still today. There's nowhere else you find life, but in Christ and him alone. And so I want to just call us to commitment right now. I just want you to bow your head right where you are. I know that uh, it's almost noon here, so we're going to just pray. You don't need to rush out. Maybe that's another thing. Just to pray. Just to rest in him for a moment. And I want to ask you, this is perhaps the most important moment you've had in a long time in your life. Are Are you in? And if you need to receive Christ today, you're like, I don't know really what all that means. We want to talk to you today, or even now, just by faith. You've heard the message today. He died on the cross for you. So with your, with your head bowed and eyes closed, just say, Lord, here I am. I give you my life. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. And for all of us just to say, Lord, let the ruins of my life, let the ruins become the ground you build upon. Let the ruins become the start of this new thing you're doing in me. I commit my life to you, to your church, to your mission, to worship you with everything that I am. It's in your name that I pray. Amen.